I'm a recovered crystal meth crack cocaine addict, uh, saved, uh, and I know I was saved by Christ, but I didn't come off the streets right into the, a church pew or a small group. I wasn't the guy living underneath the tarp underneath the bridge. I was the guy that was living in his car and living in hotel rooms. Uh, lost my job. Uh, I was shoplifting and do, performing fraudulent schemes in order to survive, but I wasn't paying the rent with that money. I, it was going in my arm and up my nose and in, in a crack pipe. I don't regret the past nor wish to shut the door in it. I consider my past not a club that I beat on my, over my beat myself over the head about. I consider it a classroom that I that I learn from and use it as a basis or a platform that I can build a life from. God doesn't make no junk. I got royal blood flowing through my veins. Uh, I have all, I have the seeds of greatness in me and I have all the tools already that I just need to harvest to become the, the, the great person that the Lord, I knew the Lord wanted me to be. I was smoking four packs of cigarettes a day. I needed to gain 30 pounds when I got sober because I looked like Skeletor, but I gained a hundred pounds. So I looked like a snake that swallowed a mouse with a big old belly. Everybody says everything's fantastic when inside this turmoil in their family and their life, right? It was probably within a few months that she was bailing me out of jail for being tackled outside of Home Depot. She really wanted to think the best of what was going on and these were all isolated incidences, but there came a point where she could no longer do that, right? I asked her if she knew what was really going on and she told me, I, I, I don't know, but I think you're addicted to heroin. I piggybacked on my father's confidence because he's owned many businesses over my lifetime. No matter what your path to sex, success is, you're going to have challenges that make you question if you've made the right decisions or not along the way to even great success. This was a very, very painful process. It was a painful process because I had to open up my insides, not just to my spouse, but to a stranger. Welcome back to the Plain Success Podcast. I'm your host, Alan Underwood, and I am thrilled, excited. I just could hardly sleep waiting for the conversation that I'm going to have today because the man that's sitting with me has made such a deep personal impact on my life, and I'm confident that he's going to have the same impact on your life. I met Rob Rossell about a year and a half ago as I was coming out of what at the time had been one of the most difficult periods of my life where I honestly wasn't quite sure how to rebuild from where I'd been. And I listened to Rob speak and share his story Rob says that after meeting with him that you'll believe that you can accomplish anything you can set your mind to, and he does not lie when he makes that statement. I left that wow. meeting feeling like I could now accomplish anything after hearing what Rob had accomplished, what he had overcome, and the trajectory that his life was on. and. I've had the privilege of observing and interacting with Rob for the last year and a half, and I just cannot wait for him to share the wisdom, experience, leadership, and discipleship that we're going to get to experience today. Rob, thank you for joining me today. I am so excited. Hey, it's, it's a pleasure and an honor, Alan, and I'm humbled by what you just shared, so thank you for that. I certainly don't feel that I affect people to that degree, but you know what? I do appreciate the warm words. It's very kind of you, man. Well, you deserve every one of them. I want my guests to get a snapshot of maybe the last 20 years of your life, and then I want to share a little bit of an insight of something I appreciate from your daily routine. So, Rob, in 2004, started an auto repair shop, 
three years after that, started flipping houses and kept a few of those as rental properties. Two years after that, began investing in multifamily real estate. And then 12 years after that, so 17 years after starting his business, had an eight-figure exit from his auto repair business. And now has over 3,000 units in 25 different complexes across six states, valued at close to $120 million, and has a really exciting project that I can't wait for him to tell us about in Las Vegas of 233 units. It's really just a, a really amazing deal. The daily habit that I wanna share, Rob, is I follow you on social media, and every day you write on a note card something that you've read from the Bible. And to honor the gift that you've given me as I followed that, I wanted to share something that as I have prepared myself for this conversation with you, I read that just, um, that I just wanted to share and then hear your feelings on it. So this uh, is a scripture from Matthew, Matthew 8, 20. It says, foxes have holes and birds, birds of the air have nests, but the son of man has no place to lay his head. Rob, you know what it means to have no place to lay your head, don't you? Before all of the accolades and success we talked about, your life was a little bit different. <laughs> yes, it was, brother. Yeah, and I know what you're referring to is my, you know, for uh, I, I was living on the streets homeless for your audience members that don't know my story. Uh, I'm a recovered crystal meth crack cocaine addict, uh, saved. Uh, and I know I was saved by Christ, but I didn't come off the streets right into the, a church pew or a small group. It was about a two-year time period from the time that I got sober to the time that I actually uh, rededicated my life to the Lord. But he has taken me from homeless to homeowner to multiple business owner, real estate investor, and financially free. And I give him all the glory for that story. It's a story that only God himself could have written, Alan, as you know. Absolutely. Well, Rob, why don't you, there's not a lot of people that experience home. I, there are a lot of people that experience homelessness. It's probably a small percentage of the people that will be in the audience that can claim to have experienced homelessness. How did you get there? You talked a little bit about the drug addiction. Um, how did you end up homeless? And tell me about that experience. What how did you feel at the time? What were some of the thoughts that you were having? Uh, walk us through the experience of homelessness. Well, you know, I was, um, first and foremost, I will say that I was upper middle class homeless, if, there's, if there is such a thing. So I, I wasn't the guy living underneath the tarp underneath the bridge. I was the guy that was living in his car and living in hotel rooms. So I always, I always you know, at the end of the day, it was really just a matter of not being able to put the crack pipe down, not being able to put the crystal behind me. And crystal was a slow demise. Crack was a very fast demise. And I went down pretty hard in 1999. Uh, 97 through 99 is where I, I lost everything, uh, lost my job. Uh, I was shoplifting and do, performing fraudulent schemes in order to survive, but I wasn't paying the rent with that money. I, it was going in my arm and up my nose and in, in a crack pipe. Uh, I was tossed from my place to live. I started living in hotels uh, when my car was, my, was a choice eventually. So again, I was living, I was homeless because I didn't have a place to send to give people as an address from my mail, but I always seemed to work out a place to lay my head. Uh, but it wasn't, you know, I'm not really proud of that life. But, you know, in the rooms of AA, in the rooms of 12-step recovery, we have a saying that says, I don't regret the past nor wish to shut the door in it. I consider my past not a club that I beat on my, over my beat myself over the head about. I consider it a classroom that I that I learn from and use it as a basis or a platform that I can build a life from. How long 
did it take you to be able to feel that way? Because I know that with some of the things that I've experienced and decisions that I've made, there was a period where the club was the weapon of choice. and I just <laughs> would beat myself with that. So I have to imagine that with what you experienced, you didn't go immediately from being it there to feeling really grateful for the experience and having learned from it in the classroom of life. Right. right. I'll tell you, it's funny. It, it, it's a gradual thing. What you're talking about is a gradual thing where with each day, each week, month, quarter – is a new level of confidence because I am now living a productive life. I do now have gainful employment. I do now have a, a roof over my wife and child's head. All those things that pretty much everybody calls normal is of confidence for me. But I will tell you, and I don't know where or when, I can't tell you where or when, but I stumbled across a book by Zig Ziglar called See You at the Top. And I was not into personal development. I wasn't even going to church yet. But uh, again, I, I may have found it in a car, a customer's car, I saw the title and purchased it myself. But I read that book. And that book took me to a new whole, a whole new level of thinking where I understood that God doesn't make no junk. I got royal blood flowing through my veins. Uh, I have all, I have the seeds of greatness in me and I have all the tools already that I just need to harvest to become the, the, the great person that the Lord, I knew the Lord wanted me to be. And that book is really what changed my thinking. That's when I started chasing the Lord. And, and for those, of, again, we didn't get too deep into my story, but I got off of drugs and alcohol for two years. I did not realize that I had switched addiction, drugs and alcohol to food and cigarettes. I was smoking four packs of cigarettes a day. I needed to gain 30 pounds when I got sober because I look like Skeletor, but I gained 100 pounds. So I look like a snake that swallowed a mouse with a big old belly. And then I, 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 I really have switched addictions. I haven't gotten rid of anything without replacing it. So in order to get rid of those things, honestly, I started going to church. I plugged in uh, once one Easter morning. I went to church and rededicated my life to the Lord and started getting on track with the rest of my life. That's an amazing journey. I love your <laughs> wife Claudia, and we just you just celebrated your twenty fifth wedding anniversary with her. Yes. When did you guys connect? Where were you in this journey? And depending on where you were, what did she see in you if it was early in this journey? And did she <laughs> see the same thing? Hey, this guy has divinity running through his his veins and he's got a great future oh in front goodness. of him. I, I'm really curious to know when she looked at the Rob Rossell 25 years ago, what was she thinking? You know, that's a great question. So I was this close to losing everything. I was managing that three bay Chevron station with that I know you can she broke she drove in one day with a broken belt. And from the outside, and addicts have a special way of hiding what's really going on, as well as as well as normies as well, right? I call it the Sunday morning smile. Everybody says everything's fantastic when inside there's turmoil in their family and their life, right? Addicts are no different. So although the, the crystal pipe was warm in my pocket, I was still running an auto repair shop. She And uh, it wasn't long after we met and connected and realized that we should be with each other that I actually lost that job and started going down, spiraling down and eventually left. So... I hid it well from her is the reason why I was able to capture her as, as my own. Yes. <laughs> so. And she was very naive. When did I that... should throw that in there, Alan. Yeah, I should throw in that. She was very naive and didn't know anything. She had been lived a very sheltered life from her parents. They took very good care of her. And by the way, I'll throw in kudos to them. I thank her mom every time she calls. And I know that Claudia is on the phone with her. I will say thank you from the background until Claudia has to acknowledge it and tell her mom that I said thank you for the job, the great job they did in raising a beautiful, beautiful Proverbs 31 woman. I love Proverbs 31. And if you haven't read it, that's a good read. If you're looking for a woman, there's no better instruction book than right there. Yeah, absolutely. So 
when did the blinders come off then? So you said that you hit it for a while, but then you went down. There had to have been a bottom point there where it was impossible to hide. Yeah, when they were shutting off the electricity and I was out there turning it back on myself, it was kind of hard to, kind of hard to hide uh, the fact that things aren't going really well financially. Yes, it's turning off the water and I was turning it back on. Um, yeah, so at the end of the day, it was probably within a few months since she was bailing me out of jail for being tackled outside of Home Depot. But again, like anything else, she had blinders on. She loved me. She really wanted to think the best of what was going on, and these were all isolated incidences. But there came a point where she could no longer do that, right? Yeah. How was that conversation, Rob? Um. It was it was uh, it was a it was a number of conversations to be completely honest with you. Mm -hmm. um, at one point in time, uh, I asked her if she knew what was really going on, and she told me, "I I I don't know, but I think you're addicted to heroin." I wasn't addicted to heroin, but she had the right idea. She had figured, even in her naive, uh, sheltered world, she had figured out that I was a drug addict and that I loved more than with just what I could possibly. Uh, do on my own so yeah well it's amazing to see what you guys have created so you you get sober um you turn your life over to the lord and and then there's another transition that happens from being sober to owning a business and that sounds like a really huge leap there's not I don't know how many people go from I just got sober to I own a business. So it walked me through what that looked like and how did you get there? Yeah, you know, um, little did I know that the Lord was preparing me under the tutelage of my, my last employer. His name was Richard Broadwater. I worked for him for four and a half years in an auto repair shop. For those that don't know, I was the guy that... I called a service advisor. I'm the guy that calls you and tells you your car needs brake pads or a water pump and how much it's going to be, and I get your approval. And uh, quite honestly, when I applied for that job, I'll tell you a story that goes along with that. It's very amazing. Um, I went to work a day. I, I, now I'm clean and sober. I'm, a, I'm fresh out of rehab. I need to start providing some, some things for my family. I go to work a day because I look like Skeletor. I wasn't on crack, but I still look like I was on crack. So I didn't think I could be a service advisor, to be completely honest with you. So I went to work a day. I filled out the application. Um, now, back in the day when I was when I was still using and I would have momentary lapse of reason, I would go to work a day and I figured out their system, Alan. I figured out that you really need to lie by 50 an hour, which was the minimum wage back then. So I would fill out the application like I could do a bunch of things that I really wasn't that good at. And then get me a work for a couple of days at 20 bucks an hour. But then I'd be asked not to come back to that job site. So this time, I, I, you know, in rehab, they taught me rigorous honesty. Rigorous honesty is how you're going to stay sober. So I knew a little bit of electrical. I knew a little bit of plumbing. And I was a service advisor. And I filled out that job application like I was a service advisor. Now, who goes to work a day looking for a service advisor? Answer, nobody. Not a million years would anybody go looking for a service advisor at work a day. But I filled out that application with complete honesty. And here's how the Lord gets involved when we do those things. I went up to the counter when it was my turn, and the nice lady behind the counter says, look, I got this electrical apprentice job for eleven fifty an hour. Or I was doing cartwheels down. That was like that was like awesome. And she says probably gonna last a week. It lasted three weeks. And, she, and then she kind of looked to the left, and she looked to the right, and she says, "And I'm not supposed to do this, but my husband owns an auto repair shop, and he needs a service advisor. And here's his business card. And I went to work for that man three weeks later, and he was the last employer that I ever had. And through his example, he taught me how to run an ethical, honest auto repair shop. Are you still in contact <laughs> with him, Rob? I am still in contact with him. He was supposed to be at the event that you attended for my 25th wedding anniversary. But unfortunately, his mom in Texas has 
very, very fragile health, so he had to be there instead. But we are in contact, and I've sent him a copy of my book that he's mentioned in my book, and uh, and over and over again for and thanking him for believing in me. Because remember, I look like Skeletor. I did not think that I should be applying for a service advisor job, and the Lord had the scales cover those things up in His eyes, and He hired me anyways with very, with a lot of teeth missing, sunken in cheeks, looking like a walking skeleton. And I like he, in fact, he bought me my first set of teeth, brother, to be completely candid with you and taught me how to do it for other people. So that being said, I'm now working for him. I'm coming up. My wife and I have bought a house and I'm going to California every now and then. I lived in Phoenix. I'm going not far from where you live. And I'm going to California in the summertime because that's what all us Arizonians do. We escape that heat for a little while every now and then, right? So, and that's every right. time I came out to California, my father would tell me about his friend, Sterling, that owned an auto repair shop and had five sons. And his ex exit strategy was for his sons to take over the auto repair shop. They all waved the white flag and said, I'm not interested besides one of them. And he happened to be the one that the father, Sterling, didn't have didn't have any confidence in that he could run that store. So he was bleeding on my father, telling him how he was losing money every month. And I told my dad, I said, look, if he comes down and starts sharing that with you, remind him that your son does this for a living and he might be interested in buying the auto repair shop. Well, fast forward three years, he calls me and says, Sterling's ready. And I said, Sterling who? <laughs> I didn't know who he was talking about. And he said, Sterling, he owns the auto repair shop. Oh, so great. So you get yeah, go the ahead. phone call that Sterling's ready to sell the business. Yeah. And I, I'm interested in knowing in that period, Rob, what gave you the idea that you could be a business owner? How long had you been working in the repair shop to that point? And what gave you the confidence to even have those thoughts? See, that's just it. I didn't have any confidence whatsoever that I could do that, to be completely candid with you, Alan. Uh, the confidence that I was there, the confidence that once we remove the veil, the curtain, if you will, that blocks you from seeing all those owner decisions and owner payments and owner this, owner that, that was still there for me because I hadn't seen behind that curtain to that level. My father was a business, I really, I, I think the honest answer, I piggybacked on my father's confidence because he's owned many businesses over my lifetime. And he, and it's funny, he went, I, at the end of November, right after Thanksgiving, we had just come back from San Diego, Bit was there for Thanksgiving. My father calls me, reminds me who Sterling is, says that he's ready and says, oh, and by the way, he wants to sell by the end of the year. That's literally 30 days away. And I says, and immediately, like anybody else in the world, I'm immediately thinking the 500 reasons why this can happen in the next 30 days. And I start spewing off about 10 of those to my dad. And my dad says, okay, well, you need to come out anyways. So I did. I took a couple of days off. I went out and I worked at that auto repair shop, Alan. And you know what I discovered? Two things. The training that Richard had given me on how to run an auto repair shop immediately allowed me to see where the value was in this business. And number two thing I realized was my father was right. This was a gold mine. Now, after flying home, my father called me, not down the wire, and he says, uh, well, what did you decide? And I said, Dad, I'm going to be honest with you. I don't think I can pull it off. And he says, well, without hesitating, he said, well, if you're not going to do it, I'm going to do it. And I said, whoa, 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 wait a second. I didn't say I wasn't going to do it. <laughs> so it was really my father's confidence that pushed me to the level where I would even consider it. And I said, Dad, let me call you back tomorrow. And I talked to Claudia, and God bless that woman. You know what she said? Whatever you decide. Now, we, oh. had, just bought, we had just bought our house a few months before. And we had a prepayment penalty for three for one year that was uh, twelve thousand dollars. That might have been might as well have been twelve million dollars, Alan, because we didn't have twelve thousand dollars. So we had to put a renter into that house. I had made a commitment. I had started a ministry that picked up 
um, sober uh, people from sobriety homes and takes them to church. I had a bus donated that was already cooking. I had to hand that off to somebody else if I was going to leave. I had sponsored five guys, and I told myself I was going to get them to a year sobriety, somewhere at nine months, somewhere at two months. So it was just all those things had to come together. And you know what? We put a renter in that house. We got a U-Haul, we loaded everything, drove cross country, put it into storage, stayed at my sister's spare bedroom, and our adventure began. So, Rob, I have a question. You, at this point, are how many years sober? Five. So you're five years sober. Why did your dad have that kind of confidence in you? I mean, he has a lifetime of evidence pointing the other direction, and then he's got five years, four or five years of my son's turned things around. Have you had that conversation? Have you asked him what made him have that sort of confidence in you? Or I, I'm really curious about that. It's a great question. I think the, the one word answer is fruit. My father saw the fruit that was coming in my life from living the life that I was supposed to live. He saw that fruit. He saw the love of my wife. He saw my kids back in my life. He saw that I had just purchased a home. And on one of his visits, my mom, who was also in recovery, and he visited me at a very, very huge 12-step meeting. And everybody there knew me by name as we walked in. And my father made a comment. He goes, oh, looks like you don't come here very often. And he started laughing because he knew that this was my new life. The fruit is why he had it. That's amazing. Have you ever asked him that question? Or are you just supposing that that's what he thought? No, he, him and I talk shop a lot because quite frankly, um, between you and me, and you got to go through the back door when it's your dad, but I was coaching him because I had worked at his store. I had visited his store, my dad's store, because he owned an, uh, he owned a, I did full retail auto repair, like fix your car. You know what I'm talking about. Belts, hoses, tires, water pumps. My father did some of that, but he also did custom metal fabrication and bus repairs. And and he wasn't charging. He was give, he was what I call giving away his marking up his prices enough to be profitable. So there were jobs that he didn't really make a whole lot of money on. So I was coaching him and we were having long conversations about that. So he knew that I knew my business very well. That's great, Rob. So you pulled up the roots, you moved to San Diego, you're living with your sister, You <laughs> now the veil is gonna get ripped off on all of this ownership stuff. And it's a surprise that going into that, you don't become an addict all over again because <laughs> it's not easy being a business owner and entrepreneur. So I would love to know what were some of the challenges that you faced? Cause you and I share this in common, I owned auto repair dealerships and car dealerships for 13 years. So I know the challenges that can, that you can face okay. going into that business. So what were some of the challenges that you faced and how did you handle that the first couple of years? Probably the biggest challenge that I faced was I was the business, you know, as a small business owner, a solopreneur, if you will, in the beginning, uh, and I don't care what anybody says. You can listen to the gurus on 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 uh, on social media. You're going to you're going to be a, thank you. You're going to be a little bit out of balance when you get a business off the ground. You, unfortunately, I live a balanced life today. I believe in balance. I teach balance. But when you're an entrepreneur, solo off the ground, you are the business, and you're going to be there from sun up to sundown, kind of like working a farm, right? There's no choice. You're just going to get it done, and and the biggest, we couldn't do anything besides that business. Claudia was at the front counter. I was at the front counter. And eventually we hired people and replaced ourselves. But that first couple of years was was uh, was, a, was a big challenge. It was really, really overwhelming. I look back on it now and I think, oh, my gosh, we worked so hard and we had so many people. I won't say betray, but it's close that said they were going to do something, the working for us that didn't do it, that whose loyalty really wasn't there. Um, and I just, I just kind of, we just, we, we, we took our, we took our lumps those first few years, as you know, as a business owner, that's what happens. Yeah. 
what was the impact of those couple of years on your relationship with Claudia? Because I imagine that before this, you were working <laughs> at the repair shop. She was doing whatever she was doing. And I don't know that story, but now you're thrust into this business ownership place. It's sink or swim, life or death. You make it or break it. And now not only are you dealing with the complexity of learning a business, but now you just got mashed together in a whole different kind of relationship outside of your home where now you're business partners and working together. Uh, so how did that work? Well, you, you, your perception is amazing to me, Alan, because there's two things that will test a marriage. One of them is when a husband and wife try to back a 40 foot motor home with the wife acting as a spotter. And the other one is a husband and wife trying to work in a business together, right? And all the people that ever had their wife back them with a trailer are all laughing their asses off right now because they know how true that is. Well, it's no different when you work in the same business. Her background, to answer your question, was working in a medical, uh, a medical office. So she understood the processing of paperwork and the admin and dealing with clients and all that. But we had never worked together before. And chapter six of my book is called, You Won't Always Feel Like You're Winning. No matter what your path to sex, success is, you're going to have challenges that make you question if you've made the right decisions or not along the way to even great success. So my, and that chapter talks about my wife's, my wife and I's challenges. Um, we had some path things for my drug addiction that had never been properly worked through with counseling. And we all think those things are going to fix themselves. And I'm, I'm going to be a spoiler. They don't, right? So they just, they don't fix themselves. <laughs> so it took a marriage retreat, counseling, some really, really good marriage mentors in our life in a small group within our place of worship. Um, and there's still our great Hey, Jamie and Mike Petricelli, really, really good friends that set the foundation of what a healthy marriage looks like. And over a period of time, the healing took place. And as a man, as a man, especially an addict man, but I'm going to speak for every man, this was a very, very painful process. It was a painful process because I had to open up my insides, not just to my spouse, but to a stranger. And it was very, who turned out to be a friend, our counselor. But you know what? It just, it pushed me to a whole new level. That's for sure. Yeah. But worth it. You saw the results at our 25th wedding anniversary, man. Was it worth it? Yes, it was very much it was worth it. nothing but beautiful, Rob. <laughs> we I have one of the best that... marriages I know about today, man. It's, just, it's awesome. Thank you for sharing that because I think sometimes we see, if you're just looking at the 25th wedding anniversary snapshot of Rob and Claudia, right. it could be easy for somebody who's not there to look at that and go, my marriage isn't like that. This obviously isn't working. Maybe it's time to throw in the towel. When the reality is, so my first business was a pizza restaurant with my wife. It was 16 or 18 hours a day. We built them from the ground up. So I've got pictures and you, you know my wife and she is not a burly construction worker, but I've got pictures of her with sledgehammer and goggles on and going to work, knocking out an old bar that became our first pizza restaurant. Wow. And those are times that challenge your relationship in ways that you can never expect until you're there. And I really appreciate you saying that even in the process of succeeding, you're gonna feel like you're failing sometimes. And that has been so true over and over and over again in my life and I'm sure in yours. Um, Absolutely. So you're, ha you're having this huge growth experience in life and in your marriage, but it seems like you went pretty quickly from business owner to getting curious about real estate because there's only a maybe a two or three year period before you start buying real estate and I'm assuming that's in San Diego and how did you do that was there anyone that helped you were you reading books what was your path to moving from operating a business to hey I think I've got this under control and now I'm going to start creating wealth not just income right and that's a great segue because as i mentioned before as i sat in that auto repair shop as a spectator looking at what it looked like the insides of it realized what a 
what a um, what a gold mine that it was. Uh, those first two years proved it to be true. Not only the gold mine that it already was, but we really turned it into a major, major cash flow uh, machine. And we wanted to be good stewards of God's money. And we knew that was going to take some education. So the way it went down for everybody's story is going to be a little bit different. But the way it went down for me is I'm walking through the airport and I, you know, they always put uh, at, at the front or as you're walking by the popular books. And there was a book that title caught my eye. It said, retire young, retire rich. Well, I thought to myself, I want to retire young, retire rich. So it happened to be Robert Kiyosaki's book. Uh, I did not know that there was a series. And book one is Rich Dad, Poor Dad. I did not know anything about Robert Kiyosaki or anything about this series. But I picked up that book. We were on our way to Vegas. I read that book. Couldn't put it down every time I was in the room. And uh, in the back, it advertised uh, his website. I went to a freebie. Nothing's free. We all know that. So I went to a two-hour freebie. I brought Claudia with me because I knew nothing's free, and I wanted her blessing on any decisions that I made. Uh, we bought a $500 three-day event out of that, and we bought a $27,000 full one-year education package out of that $500 weekend. And I can honestly say, uh, you know, my first wholesale deal, we made most of that back. It was a $20,000 wholesale fee. So uh, that has just paid dividends over and over and over again. Yeah. So, Rob. You hear a lot on the news right now or on social media that it's impossible for this generation to buy a home. Houses are too expensive. You can't do it. How how would you respond to that, given your experience and your wisdom now? Is that true or false? And if somebody is desirous to do what you've done, what would you recommend? What are the keys to success that you would hand anybody listening to this right now that is really just feeling either maybe they've reached a level of success and they're not sure what the next level, or maybe they're going through an addiction recovery meeting and they're just trying to figure out, I know you had some amazing goals in 1999 that I'd love you to share for you to share to put in context <laughs> how goals can change over the years. But All right. um, what would you say to that? I know I wrapped a lot of questions into one there. You did. Nice job. <laughs> so, yeah, the goals you're referring to is, man, I wanted an electricity bill in my name. I wanted my driver's license back. I drove a motorized skateboard to work for a year, six and a half miles one way and six and a half miles home in the 12-step meetings because I didn't have a driver's license. And the state of Arizona wanted $15,000 in fines paid back and a lot of classes had to be taken, safety driving classes and so on to prove I was worthy of getting a license back. That took over a year. So uh, so those were my big goals, real basic things for you and I nowadays. But boy, they were they were lofty goals back then. And so uh, the other question that you had was, uh, what would, okay, so if someone's in, all of that is education. The answer to your question is, how would I, my son right now, one of my one of my sons, 37 years old, does not have a home. He lives in San Diego. As you know, it's very, very difficult to find something that, um, you know, first-time home buyer that's entry level for him and his wife, uh, especially right now at the time of this recording. It's interest rates are averaging 6.5 to 7.5%. Who knows what it's going to be, right? So um, I, he, I, I'm teaching him get education, and he's doing it. He's at the San Diego Creative Investment Association, talking to wholesalers, looking for a way to get into a fixer-upper. He's watching YouTube videos. He's part of a coaching program that him and we go into the back door. Like, And I know you do some house flipping as well. The wholesalers looking for wholesalers that can bring him a house because that might be the way that he gets in it you know, 60% of what it would have cost him had he just gone full retail and looked for a completed home. That's one way to do it. The other way to do it is you and your significant other may need a side hustle, right? My wife and I, we had a side hustle. When I was making a hundred grand a year as a service advisor and that last job that I ever had working for Richard, I was still picking up cars, steam cleaning under the hood, doing a full detail on them, maybe fixing a few things like... Uh, by paying a mechanic, because I don't do that. That's not, I'm not a mechanic. I, I know good mechanics. Uh, I manage good mechanics. So I would 
get it all fixed up, put it back on the lot for a thousand dollars, three hundred dollars, six hundred dollars more, and we were stacking cash like that. Never made the trek over to California. I had a side hustle. I've always had a side hustle. In this case, it turned out that real estate was going to be my side hustle for auto repair. Now, as it turns out, I graduated into multifamily in 2009, sold my auto repair shops in 2021, and now it is my full-time gig. That's what I do is real estate. Yeah. So Robert Kiyosaki introduces you to the possibility of home ownership. <laughs> And then you graduate a few years later into multifamily investing. Was there another mentor there that helped with that step? Or was that just more of Robert Kiyosaki combination of the two? You know, the Lord put a mentor in my life, Dave Lindahl. And Dave Lindahl was not a personal mentor of mine. He met, he mentored from the stage. I bought into his education because we we were inducted into our Robert Kiyosaki school uh, hall, uh, intern in our school for what we had accomplished in two years, 2007 to 2009. In 2009, oh. we went to the Hall of, Hall of Fame induction ceremony and got a guy on the stage by the name of Dave Lindahl was pitching his education uh, for multifamily. We signed up for that and we're not overnight successes. I often joke about the fact that it took me 20 years to become an overnight success. With big thinking, Alan, was I went from single family, I took Spent a ton of money on, on multifamily education, and we graduated to sixplexes. I mean, that's how big I could think at that time, right? It's because I'm in San Diego. Never could I think I could do it all around the country like we do today. But it's funny how, as the progress in action, we're implementing the education that we know, we're finding that we've learned, we're finding partners that maybe know a little bit more of us and uh, than we do in certain areas. And what happens is gradually it gets bigger and bigger, and your mind gets more expanded into what the possibilities are. Yeah. Rob, I love what you shared there because I think you finally have said something that where I feel like maybe I'm as smart as you. You you said that you could be a 20-year overnight success, and I think for 20 years, that's what I've been telling my wife, is someday people are going to think we were an overnight success, but what they're not going to see is the 20 years <laughs> that it took to become an overnight success. Absolutely. <laughs> and success happened for you in a big, a really big way. You had an eight figure exit from your automotive repair business. Um, I would love to know when that opportunity showed up, what were you able to believe it was what were the thoughts that were coming to you? Because now, you know, most people get to dream about that kind of opportunity. And here you've worked for 17 years to create an amazing business that now is going to yield exponential returns and in a lot of ways really alter the fabric of your life, right? So how did that feel and what maybe responsibility did you feel uh, what was scary about it? I would love to know. You no, know, it's a great question. So we weren't really prepared for the phone call. And I mean mentally prepared. The business itself was prepared. And a funny story how this all happened. We were scaling. A lot of people don't know this or the bulls when in selling a business. But a business's value is based upon a multiple of the EBITDA, right? Earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. So every business category has a different multiple. What I didn't know is, you know, auto repairs, somewhere around the three. If you get a two because it's a high paying job, you'll get a two. If you got something that's on autopilot and it's an armchair investment, it's gonna be closer to a four, but generally it's a three. But if you got if you got enough of them and you package them together and your gross sales exceeds ten million dollars, now your multiple starts to become more than a three or a four, but closer to a seven or an eight or a nine. So we learned that along the way and we were scaling our auto repair shop chain to the point where we would exceed $10 million. We were somewhere in the ballpark of about $8 million, eight and a half. And we had just added our fifth location two weeks before. And we figured that that would be the store that over the next 12 months would get us up above that threshold. And we probably would have kept scaling because we had a good team in place. But the phone rang. I looked at my screen. 
and my phone knew who he was because it had the name came up on the screen, the ID show. So apparently I saved it, but I didn't remember the name. And I hit answer and we started chatting. He reminded me who he was. It was a guy that I had met at a mastermind of multi multiple shop owners one time. When I met him, he had nine stores and he scaled to 11 stores with him and his uncle. And he sold all 11 and stayed on as the acquisitions manager. And basically he was working his phone for other operators. And he knew I was a good operator and I knew he was too, uh, that, could, that he could possibly buy their shops. So when he said, when he got to that point and said, yeah, I stayed on his acquisitions and I was calling to see if you'd be interested in selling your auto repair shop. And I immediately, Alan, this is how professional, this is my poker face right here. I started laughing out loud <laughs> because I said, dude, I'm standing in the waiting room of the store I bought two weeks ago. I'm not ready to sell yet. I haven't hit the threshold where I can get a great multiple. We talked multiples. He says, I can probably get you that multiple right now. And I says, really? Uh -oh. Okay, well, let's talk about it. So long, you know, fast forward, oh, I don't know, six months, seven months, and they owned our auto repair shops. Rob, that's amazing. I love that <laughs> you weren't prepared for that phone call to come. Um, but I don't know that that's even a really a true statement because you've been preparing for 17 years for that phone call to come. And I love that there was intentionality behind True. you realized where the tipping point was between maybe a mediocre sale and, and where you realized the best value and that you were intentionally pointed in that direction. That's amazing. So now you have 3000 plus units and I know you're working on an amazing project in Las Vegas that I want you to talk about because it's, there's a lot of, a lot of news right now about multifamily in general. Um, there's been a lot of turmoil in that market, but what you're doing in Vegas is different. And I think really, at least from the outside looking in, is very close to your heart and your purpose. So I would love for you to share yeah. what you're doing now. Yeah, so it's extraordinary. There's no question about it. Although it just like a lot of our other projects where we're currently, and you hit the nail on the head. Let me pause for a moment. The CNN factor, that's what I call it. The CNN factor has everybody thinking that the the sky is falling and multifamily, commercial real estate, all of that is going to go to hell in a handbasket. That's not true. We've got many investments that we've got investors in on that we are cutting checks, fourth quarter checks for as we speak. So things are still healthy as long as they were bought right with not adjustable rate mortgages that are about ready to mature. None of that is us. So that being said, moving into this invest investment, this is, like you said, near and dear to mine and my partner's hearts because they come from a similar background as me. We are partnering, it's a 233 unit complex. We are partnering with the Clark County here in Las Vegas, and they have a program called Rapid Rehousing Initiative. And basically, that's a grant that they've received where they are helping people transition from incarceration, like Rob Roselle, prison, jail, rehab, back into an apartment uh, back then. Uh, didn't have, don't have credit reports that really shine. They got criminal records, although it's petty crimes and misdemeanors. Uh, they just, and they don't have the money for security deposits. So they, they, this is a hand up, not a hand out. It's a 12 to 24 month program where they give them the rent, pay the security deposit, give them pots and pans and furniture, job training, job placement, and then they wean them off the rent. They give them a key caseworker where they show up to the apartment once a week, eventually. But the, the bottom line is the goal is to transition people back into society. So we get to give good returns to our investors because they pay a premium for the rents. They give us a bonus for every lease that we sign. I mean, it's a it's a really, really phenomenal program. I could go on and on about it. But the bottom line is, is in addition to the returns, it's a humanitarian side, says so that we're helping make a change in hundreds of people's lives. Rob, that's beautiful, especially given your background and your story that now really right. probably help that you would have been looking for or needed not that long ago. Now you're providing for hundreds and possibly over the years, thousands of people. How does, how does that has just got to warm your heart 
and light you up inside. I, I can't imagine it doing anything different. Well, I will tell you, um, yes, is the answer. And just kind of backing up in my story, I went through, there was no programs even similar to this back when I got sober. Uh, and I, I did make, I, won, I, I could say hundreds, I'm going to say at least 50 phone calls only to find out over a period of time after paying the application fee, denied, 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 denied. You can only do so many per week when you're on a tight budget at uh, you know 20 to 50 bucks for application fees. So eventually you just start interviewing them. Do you run a background check? Click. Do you run a background check? Click. Do you run a credit check? Click. Because all I was looking for was Ma and Pa that didn't do that stuff. And you know what? The Lord provided. And I found a house for us to move into, but it was only through my own tenacity, tenacity and figuring it out. You want to call it manipulation? I'll concede. I had to manipulate the details so that I could find a, a, a land. And that's the problem with recidivism is people are going back to prison at about 80 to 85 percent because there's no home plan. They have no housing. And people don't even realize this. In Clark County, in, in Clark County, you could get five year prison term for petty theft, grand theft auto, shoplifting too many times, whatever. And you'll get, you'll be a model citizen. You'll get paroled at two years, two and a half years. And if you don't have a housing plan, if you don't have a Rob Roselle and three keys communities that will allow you to come in with a little bit less credit, with a little bit of a background that's, that's, um, that's uh, not looking the greatest, then you will sit there in prison and do your time because you don't have a housing plan, even though you've been released. Currently, as we speak, there's 236 people sitting in prison that have been paroled, that don't have a housing plan, and they're going to sit there for the rest of their time. It's crazy, Alan. It's crazy. Oh, Rob, what a beautiful thing that you're doing. And that that's not the only way that you're providing housing for people that can't <laughs> do that for themselves, right? Uh, right? Tell us a little bit about the charity that you've created. I'm, I'm making the assumption it's your charity. Uh, I see what you're doing, and I've heard you talk about it, but I'd love to know more about another way that you're providing homes for people that can't do that for themselves. Well, you're not making it a very easy task to be a humble guy on your podcast here, Alan, but I'm going to, I, I'm so thank you for allowing me to plug these things because this is another one that is near and dear to my heart. Um, you know, I went down with my church. I go to, um, I go to the crossing Las Vegas here in Las Vegas, Nevada. And I have been on many missions trips uh, to build a house and it's, generally unorganized and get away from materials and you get there and nobody even knows what's going on. It's a five to seven day project. You carve out seven days. And I heard that it can be done in two days or less. So I went down with my church just kind of as an, as an undercover covert operation to see how it was done. And you know what? I was blown away, brother. They do it in a day and a half. At two o'clock the second day, we were doing the key ceremony, and they were and these uh, home recipients were walking in their new home. Can't, I mean, it's not Taj Mahal; it's a sixteen by twenty box. But to get it done in that short amount of time, the the slab is poured, the materials all there. I was just blown away. And you know what? The Lord tapped me on the said, "Rob, you need to not go down with your church." every year, but to start your own trips. And I want you to take down three trips per year. Well, in 2023, I organized two trips. We built a total of nine houses, because when we go down, we take 100 people or people and 20 people per house. We built five houses in two days. We built four last trip and five the trip before that. So we built nine. We've got three trips scheduled for this year, April, July, in October. So April 11th, Thursday night, we arrive into San Diego. We have dinner. We stay in a nice hotel in Hotel Circle. Uh, Friday morning, the 12th, we drive into Tijuana, drop our belongings in our rooms, our nice rooms, beautiful rooms in the compound, and then go to work, build a house on Friday, build a house for half of a Saturday, and come across the border on Sunday morning and come back. So it is the easiest, easiest international uh, missions trip that anybody will ever participate in. It is amazing. And you know who gets blessed the most? You and me. Yeah. Yeah, no <laughs> doubt about it. I want to give you a chance to plug that while we're on the topic. If yeah, someone's thanks, interested man. in doing that with you, Rob, how do they sign up? Where do they go? 
That's a great question. So uh, my name that's on the screen, dot com, robrosell.com, R-O-W-S-E-L-L. And uh, go to my website, click the drop down, click on Mexico. And if you can't come physically, because we are taking applications, we still have about 40 slots to fill for April, the April trip. If April doesn't work, we're going in July and October, fill it out. But if you can't come physically, each house costs $12,000. Sponsor a house or sponsor sponsor our participant. Each participant raises about $1,300 to pay for their portion of the house. Maybe a house is too much, 12K. Maybe you could sponsor one, two, three, four, five individuals and make it so that we could make it available to people who want to go physically but don't have the money. And Rob, who are those trips open to? Is this adults? Is it teenagers? What? Who's eligible? Everybody's eligible right down, I think, six years old is the cutoff so we do have some some because they were you know the people we're building homes for our kids play with their kids while we're there uh, but teenagers youth groups um, we've had a father and son teams mother and daughter teams this is co-ed my wife goes my 10 year old grandson was on one of our trips so yeah it's a it's a That's co-ed amazing, family Rob. event yeah it is amazing it's cool so rob there's a few things that as i've been preparing for this conversation that intrigued me things that you've said maybe on some other shows one of them was one can touch a thousand and two can touch ten thousand i'd like to know how claudia has multiplied what you're doing in your life what are the gifts and talents that she's brought to your team that have allowed you not just to touch a thousand but to touch ten thousand and i and i would say hundreds of thousands or millions knowing claudia (laughs) <laughs> well, I got to tell you, um, a couple of things come to mind. Number one is the the book by Gary Chapman called uh, The Five Love Languages, right? By reading that book and understanding each other's love language, she knows she's got it easy because, and I got it easy as well, because my love language is words of affirmation. So if she just gives me a pat on the ass and tells me I'm doing a great job, I'm good for another week, right? Her Love language is receiving gifts. So all I've got to do is go shopping for the things I know that she loves. So we both have a pretty easy street there. Um, there, And and there's more to it. We all have a couple of love languages within the five. But my primary and her primary are very easy for us. So she encourages me is answer number one. But also number two is she's very good at the admin. I'm the visionary. I throw the mud at the wall. I determine what where we're going and, and, and build the org chart and hand it to someone else. She's the behind the scenes that crosses the I's or crosses the T's and dots the I's and makes me look good. When the banker sends an email and says, I need this, 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 and this, eight minutes later they have that, 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 and that because of Claudia. <laughs> That's awesome. And she's a great dance partner from what I witnessed at your wedding, too. She's a partner. If it wasn't for her, I would never dance. She's, and she, her <laughs> words of affirmation of how I can dance even gets me up on the dance floor, yes. She is helping you dance your way through life, Rob. I can see that when you guys are together. <laughs> so there's another way that you often say that you're committed to giving is, and honestly, if you were to look at my vision board that's the home screen of my computer i've taken something that that i heard you say and adopted as my own and that's that we're responsible for giving time talent treasure and testimony can you talk about what that means to you yeah so time can be two different ways right so time with the lord right so let's take time first time with the lord he's given me everything from my sense of touch my sense of smell my hands that work, my feet that work, or even if one of those or both of those didn't work, all the gifts right down to my last breath of fresh air. How can I not dedicate some time each day, five to to 60 minutes with him, uh, time attending my place of worship, time pouring into people that I went through that maybe aren't as far through just yet. All of that is time, right? So time our talents. You can do things that I can't do. I can do things that you can't do. He wants me to bring my talents to the marketplace uh, for his kingdom, not just not just to earn income, but for his kingdom. Uh, treasure, that's an easy one, man. The tithe, Malachi 
three eleven, I think it is, where he he challenges us. It's the only thing God's ever ever told us to test him on. Give me your money, and I'll give it back to you twentyfold, pressed together in your lap. And you know what? I've experienced that, and I've experienced that not because you know people will say, people will say, well, sure, you can you can tithe. You're rich. No, I'm rich because I tithe. I tithed when it hurt, and the Lord has shown me I can't outgive him over and over and over and over again. I can't I can't explain that, Alan, other than I tithe. And then testimony, God doesn't take any of us through the minefield. You've got a testimony, powerful one. And if you were talking right now, I'd be taking notes. And everybody you ever interview on this podcast, they've got a story, right? And the and for us to for the Lord to take us through that story successfully and for us to sit in front of the tv with a remote control in our hand and not tell the world from the mountaintops what the lord has done for us shame i love it rob i, I want to give you a chance here at the end to talk to three specific people so the first person that i want you to talk to Looking back with wisdom now on where you're at is uh, Rob at 32 or 33 years old, arguably at the bottom, uh, dealing with addiction, uh, experiencing not complete homelessness, but maybe an upgraded version of homelessness, as you explained earlier. <laughs> Looking back upper middle at class, that Alan. Version, upper middle there, class. There, <laughs> Looking at that version of Rob or somebody else maybe who's struggling with similar challenges, what advice would you give to them today that would help them experience hope, happiness, prosperity, and purpose? The first thing that I would say is it's a journey. <clears throat> no deserve it, and it's going to take some work to deserve it. So it's little things that we do every day. There are no big one thing is going to make you all of a sudden happy. It's little increments that we do every single day, and we get better and better and better at doing them. That's number one that comes to mind. Number two is reach out and get help. Satan loves when we are the lone wolf and he can take us out because we're easy prey. We've got to get around our pack, whatever your pack is. For me, it was it was um, Cocaine Anonymous today. <clears throat> Excuse me. Even today, Monday night, two night morning, I was at Celebrate Recovery because that's my pack. We've got it. And last night I was at a Bible study, learning how to read the Bible. I've been reading the Bible for 23 years, Alan. I went to. I'm I'm currently on week three of a seven week study to learn how to read the Bible. That's my pack. Tonight I'm going to a marriage encounters leadership class so that I can learn how to help others correct their marriages. That's my pack. Get around your packs because, again, alone, we are easy, easy prey. Now, that might just be going to a meeting, finding the sponsor, getting its phone number, and making that connection. So when I feel like doing those things that I know are taking me down, I can pick up the phone and, and reach out to somebody and say, please talk me off this ledge. Thank you for sharing that, Rob. I think that's beautiful advice. And and I've seen you do that with people in your circle where you've either helped them find a pack or been a part of their pack and, and helped them just as, as others helped you. Okay, so the next person that I would like to speak to is that here's the person who is looking at buying a business or maybe you've said and, and we've talked about something gets planted on your heart. It's start a charity thing in Mexico. It's buy a business. Maybe it's start a podcast whatever that dream is that shows up as a dream but feels like a nightmare because it's scary and you don't feel like you're good enough to do it. I know you've experienced that over and over and over again on your growth. What would you say to that person who's maybe hesitating to respond to that, that call of their heart to do something big and scary? Well, I think we've all heard the saying before that outside of our comfort zone is where life begins, right? And I, I'm a big subscriber. I know you are too. Kudos to you for beginning this podcast because I know it's way outside your comfort zone. And by the way, if you don't know this already, you're doing fantastic, brother. You're an amazing, amazing host. And I know that you're going to blow this thing up. But um, chapter, we talked about chapter one of my book, 
Chapter one is you got to be done. Remember when I was sitting in my probation officer's office and I had that packet to fill out and I said to myself, I am done. That's chapter one of my book. Chapter two is you've got to get and take action, right? So the what what gets what what alleviates the fear is stepping out on faith. And as hard as it is now, does that mean we just aimlessly step out and do things and risk money without getting some good education, some good counsel, some good coaching? No. Money spent in coaching or even nowadays YouTube University, you just got to qualify that it's good education, make sure they've got some successful students that have done the hero's journey all the way to success and then start learning from them. I watch a lot of people for free. Right now I'm watching some uh, some some YouTube videos on how to do a um, an online class, right? How to produce an online class. And she's got a lot of free content before ever buying into her stuff. If I ever decide to do that, find somebody that's walked the minefield that you're about to walk and get as much information as you possibly can. And you know what that does? It builds confidence and removes fear. That's awesome. Okay. Okay, so the last person that you get to talk to, Rob, one of your favorite taglines is the best is yet to come. So <laughs> as you look at Rob Rossell in five or 10 years, what does that look like? And what advice well, are you giving the future version of yourself today? That's a great question, man. So, and, the, and again, you're a great host because no one's ever asking that question. So here's what it looks like. Five or 10 years from now, I look back, I'm embarrassed. I'm embarrassed at the man I used to be because I am continually working on myself every year to where five years from now, I'm not just double the man that I am in all areas that I, that I, that I build on, whether it's my walk with the Lord, whether it's my personal health, whether it's my relationships, whether it's my finances and wealth, whether it's my contribution back to society, my personal development in all areas, all of those will not just be twice as good five years from now, but 10 times because what happens is as you get better and you double, that compounds. And just like a penny doubled for five years, or excuse me, for 30 days is north of $5 million. A penny doubled every day for 30 days is north of $5 million on the 30th day. And you know, on the 29th day, it's half of that. So what we need to do is continually build on ourselves and be, and I call it being in a mission of discovery. I am constantly on a mission of discovery in my walk with the Lord, my relationships, my health. Hey, I don't have a six pack. I've, and I'm talking about my belly muscles right now, a six pack. I don't have a six pack. I've never had a six pack. I lost 70 pounds. I'm pretty fit. I'm pretty muscular, but I've never had a six pack. You know what? I've on, By April 15th, I will have a six pack. I'm going to claim it right here in public so you can keep me accountable, brother. I am trying to be the best version of me every single day. So five or 10 years from now, Lord willing, I live that long. It's going to be a sight to see, brother. It's going to be a sight to see. Uh, I knew, Rob, when we started out this show that no one would be disappointed. Uh, I am just so grateful for your time, for your wisdom, for your friendship. Uh, I love you, brother, and I love cannot too, wait man. to see you standing with that six-pack on April 15th. And, well, I, I'm headed down that same journey, Rob. I committed uh, in November to to losing 43 pounds. I'm halfway to that goal today. And uh, like you, I've never, I've only seen a six pack in the grocery store. So I, right. I am excited to see, to be wearing one underneath my t-shirt. Amen, uh, brother. Rob, if I know you do some coaching, people can invest with you. Uh, they can do these trips with you. What's the easiest way to find and connect with you so that they can continue to grow with you, be inspired by you, learn from you just like I have done. Uh, Instagram. Instagram is the easiest way. It's a great communication tool. You can find out more about me by watching some 30 second videos, see what I'm all about. But yeah, and that is at Rob Roselle. I'm not real creative. It's just at Rob Roselle. You'll find me. I'll come up. I'm going to be the top one by the time you get halfway through my last name. Awesome, Rob. Thanks again for your time today. This has been great. Thank you, brother. Great job. Rob Rossell is doing amazing work 
providing homes for people who otherwise might be homeless or underhomed. I love the work that I get to do for Angel Flight West. Angel Flight West and our volunteer pilots provide free flights for people in need of medical care far from home. If you or someone that you know needs medical care and is having difficulty arranging the travel or paying for travel that is hours from home and requires extensive planning or preparation, please reach out to our coordinators. Look us up at www.angelflightwest.org. Myself and our other volunteer pilots would love to help your family solve the difficulties of medical transportation far from home.